team. So I've been in and around the team, the senior team for a while. And obviously I've been to a couple of Commonwealth games for, for Wales as well. So yeah, I'm, I, you know, it's, it's great whenever you get to represent Great Britain. Um, but for me, it's about the athletes. You know, if it's about getting them to be in a great position so they can go and perform where they want to be, you know, and, and if I can support that by being there, great. You know, it's a great opportunity for me to be in that, in that environment and learn from those coaches. Um, you know, I've not been on a team with those guys before, so hopefully there's going to be a big learning for me there. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm really looking forward to it. I'm really excited about working with those guys and and ho- hopefully bringing something to the team that, that that's not been there. Welcome to the Propulsion Swimming Podcast, where we aim to give swimming the coverage and publicity it deserves. Every week, we celebrate the sport we love with amazing special guests and topics from around the swimming pool. And now, here are your hosts, Scott and Dan. Hello everyone and welcome back to another episode of the Propulsion Swimming Podcast, episode 111, would you believe? Um, I'm your host Scott and joining us this week is a guest who is a firm request of my co-host Tan. <laughs> yeah. Well, if you've listened to our previous episodes, I've been wanting to get today's guest on for quite a while now to pick his brains. Uh, it's going to be really interesting to hear all about the, how, how Swansea is set up, swim whales, what it's like to train top swimmers like Medi Harris, Dan Jervis and others, and also talk about being part of the British World Champs coaching team. There's there's so much to talk about on this one. Yes, there is. So please welcome on to the podcast, lead coach of Swim Wales National High Performance Centre, Adam Baker. Adam, thank you for joining us this week. How are you today? Yeah, I'm really good. Thank you. How are you guys? Yeah, we're good. good. uh, We're recording on a Monday and it's been a busy Monday. I'm sure it's been the same for you. (laughs) It's been uh, been a busy day with uh, with coaching and and, uh, meetings and things. But yeah, no, it's good to be here. Thank you for inviting me on. No problem at all. Thank you so much for giving up your time to speak to us. Um, So what we usually start with when we speak to coaches is we like to hear a little bit more about their journey through swimming. So kind of where it all started in the coaching scene for you and how did you get to where you are today? So I went straight into coaching. I, I swam until I was about 17, 18 um, for the city of Southampton, which is where I'm from originally. Um, realized that I wasn't going to move on to a, to a higher level in the sport. Um, so I started coaching. My, my dad was um, part, of, part of the club then. He was, he was in charge of like, the Learn to Swim program. So he invited me to do a little bit of teaching and then just got the bug for it and uh, started coaching a little bit at Southampton and then I moved to Winchester which is just down the road as an, as an assistant coach and then my first head coach's role was with Hazelmere um, mm. which is just south of Guildford um, just outside London and I was there for about five years perhaps um, and then I moved to Stockport Metro as a junior coach. So I ran the junior program there for maybe five or six years. The reason I moved there was because I met my wife and she uh, was, she's also a swimming coach. So she was head coach at Bolton Metro at the time. And so I moved up north from, from the south, um, coached at Stockport for maybe another five or six years. And then, yeah, I moved to Swansea then. So we were looking for a, a different different career path, if you like, different, different part of the country. And I was given a head coach's job at Swim Swansea, as it was, which is now City of Swansea Aquatics. Um, mm. Yeah, and I've been here ever since. And then five years ago, the job came up as head coach of the High Performance Centre, which was a newly, newly formed Swim Wales High Performance Centre. Um, yeah, so I moved them from the club, Swansea Aquatics, into the High Performance Centre role. Uh, working for Swim Wales, and my wife is now head coach of Swansea Aquatics. Very nice. Ah. Yeah, so would you so say it's, that's the story? Yeah. Uh, would you say it's been an easy road to get to where you are now? Um, I don't think anything's easy, is it? it you know, it, it's always it's always challenging. Um, mm-hmm. Being a club coach brings its brings its challenges. You, you learn over years. I've been coaching for maybe 30 years 
So you, you learn over years how to deal with things and, and how to manage things. But it's, you know, it's been it's been good. It's been fun. We've been pretty successful um, over over the years in in both of the oh, and sorry in all the clubs that I've, I've worked with. More at a junior level, obviously, and a youth level. Um, up until I moved into the high performance centre. You know, but when we when I was head coach at Swim Swansea, we we put people on European juniors quite regularly, youth Olympics as well most most years. Um, yeah, so it's always a challenge, but it's it's a good challenge. Um, and now the new role in the high performance centre brings different challenges because you're working with with senior athletes at the elite end. Mm. I was going to. Um almost flatter you with your coaching pedigree. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go through it because you said you've coached swimmers to be selected and win one medals at the last two European Youth Olympic Festivals. You've had four European Junior Championships. You've had swimmers selected for that. You've had FINA World Open Water Championships and you've also had Commonwealth Games swimmers. So that's quite an impressive kind of results for junior swimmers so far. How do you envisage getting the same results for the for the seniors that you're now coaching? Well, I hadn't thought of it like that in terms of what I'd coached at that level. You don't think about that until mm -hmm. someone brings it up. And yeah, we have been successful at the junior levels th through the club programs. Um, I think it's about it's about learning all the time. Um, it's about you know, staying focused on what the end goal is. Um, you know, working with the senior athletes brings different different challenges. You know, they you know they like to have an input and a, and, a, and, a, and an opinion about what they're doing, which is great. We we want them to be involved in in the management and the delivery of their program. Um, whereas at a junior end, it's probably more about um, just delivering that to them. Um, you know, we are learning all the time, but we've had some really good successes since we started the High Performance Centre in, in Swansea as well, you know, in, in terms of uh, Commonwealth Games 2014, um, mm -hmm. Dan Jervis and, and Alice Thomas, and, and then Commonwealth Games 2018, again, Dan Jervis and Alice Thomas at a senior level. And then we had three people on the Olympic team last year. So I think we are transferring, transferring it across to the senior level, but there's still work to be done. You know, we want to be coaching at the highest level so not just not just making teams we want to be delivering podium results which is uh the next big step for us i think yeah i mean we've talked a lot on the podcast about how hard it is for summers to transition from junior to senior but never really thought about it as as a coach uh i don't know how how have you found it is it just as challenging it is just as challenging yeah like i said it's very different i think at a junior level um <laughs> Athletes do improve any any way, not regardless of what we do, but you know, due to growth and, and mm. you know, growth spurts and, and levels of maturity, they, they improve naturally. Um, you know, when you're coaching senior senior athletes, there, there is going to be a little bit of a plateau, um, which we've had before. You know, with Dan Jervis in particular, um, you know, but it's it's about staying positive and always remembering what the what the overall outcome is and, and keeping keeping belief in what they're doing. Um, mm -hmm. you know, remaining positive and trusting, trusting the plan, I think is, re is really important. Mm. Yeah. Let's touch upon the setup then at Swansea. How does it work inside the high performance center? Because I know you work side by side with Stuart McNary. Yeah, that's correct. So there's, there's myself, um, and I'm, I'm the lead coach of the performance center. Then we have Stuart McNary. Um, we work really, really closely together, as you just said. So um we plan everything together we we design the program together um and we coach daily together and it, and it's it's one group of athletes so we have 17 athletes currently uh, in the high performance center and we have that as one group clearly there's there's differences when it comes down to when it comes down to key sets but again we work on, on the plan um really really closely together in designing what each individual athlete does we do that on a weekly basis um, within that structure as well, we have Graham Antwistle, um, who's one of our one of our coaches. Um, we have Spencer Fuge, who is our S&C coach. We have Helen Parrott, who's our 
uh, performance scientist. Um, and then we have a load of other support network as well in terms of physio, soft tissue, um, sports science. You know, we have, we have the whole package. But in terms of day-to-day -day management of the program, Stuart and I work very, very closely together designing it and delivering it. Yeah. Is, is there an emphasis on sharing your workload as coaches, almost to protect your longevity as much as the swimmers? Yeah, well, there, there is. Yeah. So we, at the start of the season, we, we plan, we plan the year, we plan in when we're going to take key points off in terms of, in terms of the coaching staff. And we do that, not just with myself and Stuart, but with, with the whole team. Um, we, we plan in long weekends off, which we give to the staff and we give to the athletes. And that's normally midway through each training cycle. We would give them maybe three to four days off as, as a coaching team and, and a group of athletes. Um, yeah, and we're, we, I think we're really good here in Wales. We do look after each other in terms of in, in terms of our, our mental health, if you like. We're, we're very supportive uh, as a as a coaching team, not only in the high performance centre but as a national team. Um, the, the whole team is is really close, which which includes Graham Wardell from Cardiff. He's a big part of our coaching team, um, as the other high performance centre in, in in Wales. Yeah, I was going to say that because obviously I swam for Cardiff way back when, <laughs> and the, the in in Wales there's almost like a, a close knit sort of togetherness with those with those two clubs in particular down the south of Wales. I assume you share the same goals and same targets as a as a nation more so than individual clubs. I think so. Look, we're we're a very small nation, population of mm. three million maybe. So it, it's. Yeah, it's very small. I said there's larger counties in England, so we have we have to be close. We have to be tight in what we do. We we have to be um, we have to have a really good plan, a, a really good strategy about what we're trying to deliver, um, which is which is guided by the performance center. Uh, sorry, the performance director, um, Ross Nicholas. Um, but yeah, we are close and we work really closely together. So myself, Stuart, and Graham are, are the coaches on the Swim Wales Elite squad. Um, so we're, we, you know, we're away quite a lot of the time together. Um, you know, we, we coach each other, each other's athletes as well. So on a Saturday morning, we come together as two high performance centers and, and train together in Swansea. Um, so Graham brings his high performance center athletes into the environment and we, we train together on, on that day. So that's a once a week, uh, every week, but then it's about just keeping keeping close contact um, with what we do across across the groups and across the pathway. Um, you know, we, we meet fairly regularly. You know, we meet as a national coaching team once a month sort of formally to discuss each individual athlete. And and that's throughout both of the high performance centers. Um, and we, we sort of discuss some of the high performance athletes as well that are based in Bath and, and uh, mm -hmm. throughout England as well. What's the benefits of sharing that kind of almost support network with each other. Does it mean that things don't get stale for you? You always get kind of an outside opinion on your swimmers? Yeah, look, we're always learning. We all, we, we, we all bring different things. So I bring different different things. Stuart brings different stuff again. And, and Graham Wardell, with, with his many years of experience, bring, brings a, a very different approach to what we do. So it's, it's about building on what we know and what, what we've learned as individuals, but then keeping the like you said, make sure we're not keeping it stale by, by bringing in different opinions throughout. So yeah, we share very close information around what we do in terms of testing and, and training ideas and training models throughout the, throughout the pathway. Graham Wardell used to coach me actually when I was, when I was a kid. So he's known me pretty much my whole life. So we have a really good working relationship sort of and a relationship outside as well because we've known each other for so long. Mm. Yeah, I mean, it's clearly working. I mean, we're going to move on to Dan Jervis and freestyle training because he is doing pretty well, it's safe to say. I mean, he had a brilliant Tokyo, came fifth in the 1500. Uh, what's it like to coach him? Um, challenging, as it is, I imagine, with any with any uh, high performance athlete, you know, they, you know, he challenges us on a daily basis um, in good ways. You know, he makes us think about what we need to do next. Um you know, he's a good guy, Dan. I've coached Dan. Uh, I've coached Dan since he was 15, so 10 years. So we've got a really good relationship that's been built up over time. Um, we spent a lot of time together over the years, European Juniors and and, and Commonwealth Games. Mm. But you know, it's he started out in in the program, sort of with me in the club, 
and then obviously when I moved to the Huddersfield Centre, he came across across with me. Mm. Um, but yeah, it's good. Like he's a he's a quality athlete. Um, mm. He started off at a club called Neath. Um, you obviously know where that is, you know, being coached in Cardiff. So that's a small program. Who they did an outstanding job with him um, in terms of giving him good technique, um, you know, good good values, good work ethic. Um, and he was never, he was never an amazing junior, um, but he had really, really good potential. You know, when, when I first saw him swim, it was, there was just something about him that we liked straight away. Like his distance, his distance per stroke, his, his, his leg kick is, um, he had sort of multi strokes. He was a backstroker when he joined, but he could, he could pretty much swim everything to, to a really good level. Um, and then we just layered on some training with him. That's 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 pretty much what we did. We just layered on a bit of volume, a bit of different emphasis, put him head to head with with better athletes at the time. Um, and within a very very short period of time, he he was doing some really good things. It's simple then. <laughs> just simple. Yeah. Just that he had the amazing fundamentals in place essentially that that set him up. I think up. so. Yeah. Like like I said, the clubs that he was with before did a great job with him. Um, and and the, his previous coaches, you know, they gave him the skills that he needed. Yeah. And then we just laid on different areas with him. Just like I said, just volume and, and a bit more intensity and maybe a little bit more structure around it because we had more pool time. Um, you know, we we had more gym time, so we could give him that little bit extra that, that he couldn't get at his, his uh, previous clubs. Um, but, you know, they need to take a lot of credit for what they did because his improvement when he moved to us was it was was down to what, what they had given him before. Yeah. I mean, you mentioned about his leg kick, <clears> and that was one of my questions, actually, because he, being a distant swimmer, you see some of the distant swimmers in the world now, they barely use a kick. They're almost doing a two-beat, four-beat throughout, and he seems to do a six-beat kick throughout his whole race. Is that something that's natural to him, that's more comfortable for him, or is that something that you've put into his technique and his stroke? It's something that was pretty natural, I think. You know, he he, he was a good kicker when he joined us. And I, he kicks really hard now, and he does six-beat six kick, and his kick, his kick has improved. I wouldn't say he's an outstanding kicker. Um, but when you put that into his stroke, what it does is it balances his stroke. It gives him um, good distance per stroke. It, it sits him up really high in the water. Um, mm. So he needs that. He needs that leg kick to, to drive the stroke that makes him perform at his best. If his leg kick drops off a little bit, then you can see a different, a different rhythm and a different tempo in, in his stroke. Um, yeah. However, we are trying to get him to just back off a little bit on his legs earlier in the race. Um, so he can six beat kick, but maybe maybe not quite as hard to start with, just so he's got something in the tank. Like you said, the other guys don't do that. So yeah. um, we're just a bit sort of cautious around, can we drop the leg kick slightly without changing the, the rhythm and the timing of his stroke, just to give him a little bit more in the legs later on when he needs it. But yeah. it's not been an issue so far. It's just the next type of strategy, perhaps. Yeah, because you look at some of the other distance swimmers, Bobby Fink, of course, who can come back in a 25 point, um, which is quite outstanding. When every time I think of that, it's just incredible. So obviously, uh, with Dan being doing a six beat leg kick throughout, surely that would fatigue his legs more because he needs to come back a bit stronger at the end. So it's good that you've identified that. Yeah, he's he, look, he's really well conditioned, so he can hold that leg kick. Um, for the whole race and he can pick it up a little bit towards the end but at the moment we have we're trying to find another another way of, of finishing the race so yeah. if we can add a little bit more power onto his leg kick at the end um i think that will be that will be a good a good way to move forward yeah i think um the standout thing from dan recently is he's almost he's, he's hypercritical of his own performances um I think it's something that, champs, yeah. yes, yeah. It, it stood out to Dan, especially because actually Dan thought his 1500 this time in the season was pretty impressive, I but he, right, yeah. he wasn't pleased whatsoever. So how as a coach, do you deal with that? Yeah, he, he wasn't very happy and he is very critical of what he does. And I think he had put a lot of expectation on himself at the time because he had performed he had performed really, really well in Ireland. We went to the McCulloch meet in Ireland, I think that was in February, um, where he went 14.50, I think. 
which was about the same time as he went at the Olympics. Um, in the in the heat, it was faster than he went in the Olympic final. So I think then he put a lot of pressure on himself to to move that on again. Um, you know, and he was clearly in in really good shape at British Champs because he sung the best time in 400 on day one. Yeah. So again, he just mm. he just loaded more pressure on himself that this was going to be the one. This was going to be the the swim that was going to move him into the you know into the higher ranks if you like so he was really disappointed and he is very critical but he's like that on a daily basis in terms of in, in training um you just have to bring him back round to you know look at the work you're doing trust trust the work you're doing you don't need to put extra mm. pressure on yourself you know he trains unbelievably well so he just needs to have some a little bit more belief in in, in that and and not that he lacks confidence but you know he talks about the british record a lot and and it's not even well it's the welsh record as well obviously mm, <laughs> from yeah, david so yeah, yeah. you know he's he's just come fifth at the olympics and he's not even a welsh record holder so that you know he he looks at that quite a lot and he puts a lot of pressure on himself about that so it's just bringing him back to this is what you've done this is the work you've done you know trust your race model that we have um and as soon as he sees those things you know it normally brings him back into a really good place um but yeah, he was very, very critical of himself, and he, he did make a few mistakes at British British champs, like he said, mm. which is so good. Is it's he, a good, good learning for him. So is he confident, and you're confident that he will eventually get David's uh, Welsh record, British record? Look, I think if we keep training really well, you know, that that's all we can do. We 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 follow the plan that we have. We you know we look for the small margins that we can make improvements and and and, and we we'll see you know it, it's obviously a goal of his you know i never talk about it with him um mm. we just need to follow the process and the plan that we have put in place and and if we get all those things right on any given day then there will be a really good return from that mm -hmm. obviously his training is going well he came fifth at the olympics um how do you me and me and dan were never overly one for long distances so how as a coach do you keep long distance swimmers kind of how do you keep their sessions interesting stop them from getting tedious um, and um, maintain the enjoyment or is it a or is it a sense that dan actually enjoys those sort of sessions he gets the enjoyment from it i think it is difficult they they, you know, they have to do some volume um so he's done what did he do this morning 8k and 7,800 this afternoon. So, you, you know, he's in a big volume block at the moment. So can you make that interesting? <laughs> I don't, I don't know. Um, <laughs> you know, we, we, we try to mix it up with changes of intensity throughout some sets and, and, you know, that we have a little, we have a group of distance swimmers in the program. So that, that helps, you know, whereas in previous, previous years, he's been doing that on his own as well. Mm. Um, so, but we have two or three other distance lads in the program now, which, which help um, they support each other around that. But at the end of the day, he has to do volume, you know, so, you know, and he doesn't do massive volume and we've just increased that over the last, over the last training cycle. So he sort of went up to like 80 K last, the last training cycle and he will be about 75 K this week. So can we keep it interesting? I think it's about always again, reverting back to what, what we're trying to achieve. In, in that session so they know that well in advance um so we will plan the week on a friday Stuart and i um what the next week will look like in terms of how much volume they're going to do um who's going to be in what group and who's going to be coaching which athlete um the athletes get that then on a saturday morning for the next week so they will see what the whole week looks like for them so there's there's no surprises um they have time to process that throughout throughout the weekend and then bring any changes to us if they think they they, they want to question it um and i think that does help in terms of keeping it interesting because they they know and they have the opportunity then to bring things to us yeah. and and we can, oh, we can we can tweak it if we need to but yeah i'm not sure you can make 80k that interesting but um <laughs> that's what you have to do if you want to be a distance, distance athlete you know and like i said we can make changes in the intensity um like this evening, we did some stuff where they went in and out of training zones. We're in an aerobic phase at the moment, but we're just starting to introduce some like higher end stuff. So they did a little bit of low level stuff, bit of medley, and then they went some high end, 
hundreds. Um, so we mix things up like that to try to keep it interesting. And, and, and around when we do our speed stuff, which we do every day, even for Dan, you know, that's when we do a lot of interaction with the other athletes as well. So we would do some like some maybe chasing and, and turning chasing athletes and, and, you know, so they're working together in pairs, but they're getting their speed done as well. So, you know, and, and Dan would do that with the other distance guys with, you know, they might mix in with the 200 group for, for that part of the session. Um, mm. So that changes the dynamic a little bit in, in terms of it's not always just the two or three distance athletes. They get to mix across the whole yeah. group as well. Yeah, that's quite vital actually to try and include everyone in some sort of way. Um, does he do much turn work? Uh, yeah, well, we spent a lot of time certainly last season and, and the last couple of training cycles focusing on his turns. That was we looked at race analysis and what he needed to focus on, and that was an area that we thought we could improve. Um, we did a lot of comparisons with his turns, so his, his five meter in time, and his we actually used his eight meter out time instead of his 15 meter out time, and that was because his swimming speed was actually as fast as everybody else. So we didn't want to have too much of the swimming speed in the turn profile. So we used the eight meter turn. Um, so we spent a lot of time trying to improve that and, and which we did really, really well. Um, and, and he actually hit target um, this season. And he, in fact, he hit it, it, it in the British champs as well. So it was, it was actually a swimming speed. that was a little bit down. Um, but yeah, so look, when you're, when you're training distance and you're doing 80,000 meters a week, if, as long as you're focusing on your turns, all the time and there's always a purpose behind the turn and it's not it's not a lazy turn and it and it's there's a thought process every time you turn then you shouldn't need to do mm. too much sort of outside of that in terms of turn, turns does that make sense i think um yeah. but yeah he, he spent some time last season just focusing on that this time we've sort of switched it around a little bit so he's more focusing on can he now deliver the turn within the eighty thousand meters a week it's like yeah comes down to discipline in the end yeah exactly yeah yeah now another one of the standout swimmers coming out of the program right now is Medi harris um we spoke to her on the podcast not that long ago yeah but she is one of the newer swimmers at swansea so we kind of had a question of how do you integrate new swimmers like Medi into your team and into the high performance center sort of culture so Medi, i watched her podcast it was great um she made me sound amazing, which I quite liked, but <laughs> I don't know if she meant to do that, but, um, yeah. So Medi's Medi's move to the high performance center had been something that we've been planning for quite a long time. So we had done a lot of work with, with her coach in, in North Wales, Bron, um, again, who's, who's takes massive credit for, for Medi's Medi's development and what she's achieved so far. You know, she, again, she's done an outstanding job uh developing her um you know and she's still a big part of of what she does um but yeah so that was a planned move over maybe three years so graham antwistle who obviously works in the high performance center one of his roles or his main role is sort of coach development and he spent a lot of time working with bron and and working on that transition into the high performance center when she came to university that was something that she wanted to do. She was driving that from quite a young age. So we just linked her in. So whenever we could, we would we would get her come, to come down to Swansea um, weekends. We planned in a few weeks. So she would mix in with the athletes. So she knew everybody. She knew the coaches. She knew the, the structure and how it worked. Um, and then COVID sort of pushed that on a little bit. Um, you know, COVID sort of made that happen a little bit earlier because obviously all the pools closed, many couldn't train in North Wales as part of the elite um, national squad for, for Welsh women. We were then allowed to invite some athletes back in um, a lot earlier than, than, than clubs were. And she was a part of that. So Medi moved down. Um, we were working with, again, myself, Stuart and Graham Wardell with the elite group. We were all together at that stage during COVID. But that certainly heightened and, fat and and made them move a little bit quicker and a little bit smoother as well because it was it was it was quite intense. It was like we were there was only ten athletes I think at the time, um, maybe eight to start with. So she was thrown into that environment a little bit earlier perhaps, which which I thought I think really helped her for when her 
her actual move came um, in September of last year, her full-time move. Hmm. Yeah, she kind of said that COVID helped her in a way from doing these amazing performances, especially at Bucks. Did you expect that sort of performance to happen so soon? Well, I've been seeing her do some really, really good things in training. So, you know, the target for her was to just keep moving forward. You know, she, she developed and and did a really good swim at Olympic trials, which hmm. I think sort of went sort of underlooked a little bit. You know, she came fourth at Olympic trials. She dropped from a 62 to a 60 point mid and came fourth. Hmm. Um, so we were really excited with that, you know, she, was she disappointed she didn't make the Olympic team? <laughs> Probably, but, um, you know, that was never, ever spoken about with her. It was just about, okay, can we put ourselves in a really good position this season, um, especially after COVID and everything that happened? Um, we had seen some great stuff in training, you know, maybe had made some really good improvements in areas that, that we that we thought she could do in terms of underwater kick and, and a stroke rate and a tempo. She developed that really quickly. Um, she developed her strength really quickly as well in the gym where we when we laid some gym work onto her, um, which played a massive part in in her dropping. So was I expecting her to go 59 low? Uh, yeah, I think maybe, you know, maybe. Mm-hmm. I was pretty confident that that was going to happen. Um, you know, it was a bit early perhaps in, in at Bucks, but, I, you know, the target was to go under a minute this year for her. So... I think she was the first to admit that her performance at trials wasn't quite where she expected it to be. And she put it down to um, putting quite a lot of pressure on herself. So going forward to the summer where she's selected for the world's team, she's hopefully, touch wood, got a commie selection as well and Europeans potentially. How do you counteract or how do you stop her from putting so much pressure on herself? Yeah, she, she was the same as Dan, actually. She performed really, really well early, like you said, at Bucks and then in Ireland. So then all of a sudden, people are starting talking about her. So when she was a 60.5 swimmer, there wasn't much much going on in terms of people talking and, and, and at sort of attention. But as soon as she went 59, her name's all over Swim Swam, her name's here, and everyone's talking about what she can do. So I, I, I think that did... That did put some additional pressure. Um, mm. Again, she swam really well at trials. She swam really well in the 100 freestyle and the 200 freestyle. So she was in great shape. And it was just about that she she got nervous. She The expectation that she put on herself to achieve. Um, you know, in that environment, going in from an athlete that was a year ago going 62, to an athlete that could potentially win British champs is, is a big thing. Um, I mean, she still did win. She did win. Yeah. She did win, which and she still went fifty nine. So, you know, mm. so she still she still did a very, really really good job, and and you know we were we were still really pleased with that. You know, she and she understands that. Um, she understands that it was a, it was the pressure she put on herself that perhaps. Mm tightened up a stroke and she it didn't flow quite as quite as well as it did before um whereas in in mcculloch in ireland she was just really relaxed i don't think there was any expectation there so in terms of how we manage that like we have to expose her to, to that type of environment and i suppose world championships is going to do that <laughs> yeah you know so the more experience she can get now over the next you know, six months, 12 months, um, leading into the Paris will be vital for her. Um, you know, mm. she, she's got great potential and, and she will, she will learn and, and she will learn how to cope and manage those situations by being exposed to those things more and more, you know, and, you know, she's got some great training partners in Swansea that, that challenge her, you know, on a daily basis, obviously her and Dan, <laughs> do do very different events but they still do a lot of stuff mm. together you know she trains with alice thomas obviously olympian came seventh at the olympics and she's on the fly she trains with harriet jones um again went to the olympic games so she's she's got those athletes that she can she can bounce off of um mm. she can she can share her nerves and her concerns with she can ask questions about those type of things and how those more senior athletes have managed that situation over time um yeah so i think i think she'll be she'll be good um 
you know, and she, she will she will learn how to manage that just by the setup we have, I think. Now, as well as Dan and Mehdi being selected for the World Champs squad in June, you were also selected to be one of the coaches on the plane. What are your thoughts about that? You must be kind of happy, proud, or is it expected day job? <laughs> it's not expected, no. Like, it, uh, it's, it, it's great. I, you know, I, it, it'd be really good. I'm excited about going. Um, I've done a few senior teams for Britain in the past. I went to European short course. Um, I went to FINA World Short Course in December, but that was for the open water team. Mm. So I've been in and around the team, the senior team for a while. And obviously I've been to a couple of Commonwealth games for, for Wales as well. So yeah, I'm, I, you know, it's, it's great whenever you get to represent Great Britain. Um, but for me, it's about the athletes. You know, if it's about getting them to be in a great position so they can go and perform where they want to be, you know, and, and if I can support that by being there, great. You know, it's a great opportunity for me to be in that, in that environment and learn from those coaches. Um, you know, I've not been on a team with those guys before, so hopefully it's going to be a big learning for me there. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm really looking forward to it. I'm really excited about working with those guys and, and ho hopefully bringing something to the team that, that, that's not been there. Yeah. How much can a coach with your level of experience learn from being on coaching staff like that? You, is it literally just being a sponge and picking up as much information as possible, new information as possible? Yeah, I think so. I love, I love to, I love to chat to coaches all the time. So, you know, and I spoke to Dave Hemmings a few days ago about a few things and, you know, I think we're in a good position now in Britain where we do, we do share some ideas. We, you know, we, we want to learn. We want to learn off each other and bring different different ideas to each other. So, yeah, I'm looking forward to it. Hopefully, I'll learn something. Hopefully, I'll bring some things as well that other people can other people can use. And uh, yeah, it's exciting. Definitely. Um, we kind of usually finish these coaches' talks with almost a very big question, <laughs> and Dan's kind of dropped one on my list here, and it's <laughs> um, it is to do again with the junior to senior transition. So if there are any coaches who are listening who've had some really good success in the junior arena, um, but actually find themselves struggling to break through with senior swimmers, what would your advice be to them? I think I said it earlier. I think you have to be patient. I think that's something that that we're really good at in, in Wales. We're patient with, with athletes. We don't expect them to transition straight away because it's really, really difficult. So we, we give athletes... Of, of that level that are trying to go from junior to senior, we give them opportunities. Um, we offer them experiences. But I think that, like I said, the key thing is about being patient. If you believe that they've, they've got that potential, then, then don't give up on them. Um, you know, it is a tough move. It definitely is a tough move. But patience, trust your plan and, and, and you know, just have belief in, in what they're going to be doing. Um, and that will get you there. Um, it's when people start to give up on them and they're not quite, they're not quite making it at that level. It's quite easy to, to oh, go, who's next, you know, but, you know, they don't turn into bad swimmers overnight just because they, they're struggling to transition. It does take, a, it does take time for, for some athletes and it's not all going to happen at the same time. So yeah, have some, have some trust and some, some belief in, in your athletes and, uh, yeah, don't don't panic. Mm. Well, advice. Adam, it has yeah. been a very informative podcast. I've learned loads. I've thoroughly yeah. enjoyed chatting with you. Um, we do usually finish our podcast with some quick fire questions. Okay, How do they sound to you. Yeah, they sound good. You didn't tell me about these, but go on. <laughs> <laughs> That's the whole point. That's the idea. Um, yeah. What is your favourite stroke to coach? Freestyle. Who is your swimming idol? And it could be a coach. My swimming idol. Um, so my coach, my first coach, Dave Heathcock, I have a huge amount of respect for, and uh, obviously swimmer Michael Phelps. What is the proudest moment in the sport of swimming for you so far? In the sport of swimming, okay. So it would be we when we won medals at Commonwealth Games, we won a gold medal. Alice Thomas, Dan won a silver. So it would be a toss-up between that and the two Olympic finals we had. What is the hardest set you've ever given out in training? The hardest set I've ever given out? Um, 
So I was talking to an ex-athlete of mine who's now a coach actually a few weekends ago and he reminded me of a set that I gave them and I think it was 18400s maybe 14400s where they it was it was like four on 5 minutes one on 415 then three on 445 one on 415 two on 430 okay. one on 415 one on 415 one on 415 so that was pretty challenging there was athletes that didn't achieve that set but that some did um i don't think i've ever given that to dan so maybe i should revisit that <laughs> tomorrow morning there you go <laughs> maybe tomorrow morning, yeah. oh, i do apologize dan if you're listening um and final question if you used to go on a road trip there's three spaces in the car you can take friends family or celebrity who would you take with you i would take my granddad who passed away um about five years ago and i would also take my um my wife's father keith bewley who was a coach who passed away like the week after Um, my granddad so those definitely would be would be in there um and the third one that's a difficult one i would probably i would probably take no, I don't, I don't know. I can't say another one. Just maybe those two for now. That's all right. Adam, thank you so much for coming on to this week's episode of the Propulsion Swimming Podcast. I know Dan will be very pleased that we've had this conversation. <laughs> um, it has been great chatting to you and best of luck for yourself and all of your swimmers over a very busy summer. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much, guys. It's been, it's been great chatting and uh, hopefully it's, uh, I've given some insight into what we do. Yes, yeah, definitely. well, I think I think a lot of information has been been given from you actually. So I think it's great. Best of luck, like Scott just said. Best of luck for the summer, for commies, for for worlds. Uh, I think we're, I think we're going to do quite well. I think we're going to do all right. Yeah, I hope so. Fingers crossed, eh? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Touch wood. So that just about rounds up this week's episode of the Propulsion Swimming Podcast. If you haven't subscribed already, please do so on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, or Spotify. And myself and Dan will be back with you in seven days' time. Yes, thank you very much, everyone, and we'll catch you on the next one. You've been listening to the Propulsion Swimming Podcast with Scott and Dan. We want to thank you for joining us and invite you to subscribe to the show as well as checking out the Propulsion Swimming YouTube channel for weekly tutorials and videos to get your swimming fix. We will be back next week. Until then, we'll catch you on the next one.